regarding regarding RCOG green top garden 2020 ultrasonographic guidance is preferred for suction evacuation in curatics suction and sharp curative specimen should be sent separately for histopathological examination and NTD prophylaxis for Rh negative women. Now surveillance should be done to detect cure and to detect uh, huh? gestational trophoblastic neoplasia okay. and uh, it should be done by ियाप्लासिया and it should be done uh, by serial monitoring of serum beta hcg 48 hour after evacu evacuation and then weekly until detectable undetectable for three consecutive weeks and then monthly until undetectable for three to six consecutive month usually the average time of uh, achievement of normal beta hcg level is about 9 weeks after evacuation It is the molar regression curve. It shows uh, that uh, the normal range of beta HCG is uh, reached at nine weeks post evacuation. It is the molar curve. Uh, it is used uh, due to management of trophoblastic disease in Baba Gobindo Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Uh, here, the uh, demo, uh, socio-demographic uh, history of patient and then treatment history and then biopsy report. Uh, all should include in the first phase and then level of serum beta hcg should be monitored here uh, during follow up and during chemotherapy and uh, it is the uh, phase for follow up uh, in different date and who scoring system uh, it should be uh, patient should be scored by this and finally the car uh, phase for chemotherapy Now regarding contraception, effective contraception is mandatory during surveillance period. Most method can be safely used after treatment for DTD with exception of intrauterine contraception. And uh, the uh, contraception can be started immediately after the uterine evacuation and contraception, uh, contraceptive method does not influence the mean ECG regression curve. Pregnancy may be planned if beta HCG is undetectable for three consecutive weeks and then for three consecutive months. During subsequent pregnancy, early ultrasound scan should be done and after subsequent pregnancies, histopathological examination of placenta or uh, product of conception and then uh, beta HCG is monitored six to eight weeks after delivery. Regarding hysterectomy, it may be performed if patient desires surgical sterilization uh, when age is more than 40 years and hysterectomy does not prevent metastasis. Uh, so regular follow-up with monitoring of beta HCG level is essential. Ovaries may be preserved even in presence of prominent thicalutin cyst. Regarding prophylactic chemotherapy, long-term prognosis is not improved by prophylactic chemotherapy. Significant toxicity preclude routine recommendation. Useful in the high-risk cases when follow-up is either unavailable or unreliable. So, at the end of the presentation, now the take-home message: uh, patient with GTD should be managed in specialized centers. Careful evaluation and treatment of the disease is very important. Counseling for regular follow-up after treatment is essential for early detection of gestational trophoblastic mm. neoplasia. Thank you very much. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Shami Mathilduri, for your presentation. So, shall we go for the poll questions now? Then the, our faculty, Dr. P. K. Shekran, sir. He will go through his presentation. Tanya, please give your poll questions. As at the beginning of the program, there was a, I have the uh, electricity problem, so I could not start it. 
So please, the show the poll questions. The, all the participants are requested for poll booting. At the end of the session, the, again, the poll questions will be shown in the screen. And at the end of the session, the three winners will be selected. And the, all participants are requested to share your uh, questions in the chat box. And so our faculties, they can answer this. We are very happy that we just a minute. Anya? Tania? 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 If you can please stop it, you're showing the poll question. Okay. So poll voting is going on. Please answer the poll questions. That all the participants are requested to answer the poll question, please. Thirty seconds is question.
Tania? Tania? Yes, ma'am, tell me. Is question six? Yes, yes. Stop with them. Now I would like to request our today's faculty, Professor Dr. Shekran, Speaker Shekran Sar. Sar is the former professor and head department of OBGYN Medical College, Calicut, Kerala, India. Sar was the vice president of Foxy in 2010, and she was president in Kerala Federation of Ops and Gaini in 2003 to 2004. And she was the secretary and treasurer International Society of the Study of GTD from 2013 to 17. And she was the chair and World Congress of GTD in 2009. And SAR has the 41 publications in international and the national journals and the chapter of PG textbooks. And she serves as the captain in Indian Army in Medical Corps with the active participation in 1970 on in Indo-Pak War and, uh, in the, uh, and wins in the birth of the Bangladesh. I request Dr. P. K. Shekran Sar to go through his presentation. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Now, there is, uh, I think, uh, the same way I was asked to make a presentation which uh, Professor uh, has presented early. I think it may be an overlap, but uh, it's okay. We will uh, <laughs> learn it better. So the same line of the presentation, I have also made my presentation, of course. Maybe a repetition, it will be. So I'll uh, try to emphasize the, some of the points because after seeing the answer, I think it's okay even if you repeat by course, if there are postgraduate students, it may be useful that way. Okay, uh, thank you very much once again. Now, as we know, as it is already presented, gestational proloblastic disease results from abnormal proliferation of the placental trophoblast. In fact, Gestation trophoblast neoplasia is the most curable of all gynecological malignancies. It has got a very good sensitive tumor marker, the SCG, the amount of which will tell the volume of the disease also. And we use it very well for the monitoring and follow-up as well as the <coughs> disease cure also. Now, as already said, GTN, GTD means all the components of benign and malignant. So the GTD includes the external trophoblastic disease of the pre-malignant lesions of a complete and partial mold. And the GTN is uh, invasive mold, choreocarcinoma, PSPT, ETT, and even persistent elevation of the SCG without the tissue diagnosis of uh, any invasive mold or CC, we are able to treat on the marker when it is rising or plateauing. Now, there is a wide variation of epidemiology as it was reported and presented. Now, epidemiologically, present study shows that there is not much difference in the Western world as well as in the Southeast Asia as well as Japan. In the recent reports, is almost equal to the Europe or USA. Anyway, the overall incidence is one to four per thousand pregnancies. This is of adaptive per mold. It's more frequent among teenagers and elderly women because the disease, the adaptive mold, results from abnormal gametogenesis and fertilization. And the risk increases after the age of 35. Teenagers have twice the risk and five to 10 times risk after the age of 45 years. 
Most important risk factor is the history of previous mold. The risk increases by 10 times. That means if it was one per thousand, it may be one in 100 or one percent. Familial mold is a special condition which requires all the time and uh, that uh, lady unfortunately may not have a chance to have a normal child. Photocarcinoma is rare. It is one in 40,000 to even four to five times so that of the US and UK, uh, Europe in Southeast Asia and Japan. Uh, genetics of the mole was also presented. It is due to the abnormality of the ovum that results in hydatribum mole. It is due to the abnormal gametogenesis and fertilization. Due to fertilization of abnormal ovum. In complete mold, the abnormality is there is an inactivation of the maternal haploid set of chromosome. So an empty ovum is getting fertilized. In partial mold, the ovum usually allows only one sperm to enter for fertilization. But here, it allows two sperms. So there is again the defect in the ovum. In biparental uh, familial mold, there is uh, imprinting defect due to methylation defect in the paternal genome, and that results in the expression of only the paternal genome. So that is resulting in complete mold. Now this uh, again, uh, the empty ovum containing the 23X is inactivated or extruded, and a sperm containing 23X is getting fertilized duplicates to form the 46 excess and it multiplies with uncontrolled fertilizer multiplication. It can be due to the fertilization by 2x, 23x or y. That is about heterogeneous, uh, heterozygous uh, natural mold. Partial mold, as said, is fertilization by two steps, 69 xxy usually, and it can have a very mild course. There is a fetus or embryo which is abnormal. This biparental mold is a recurrent mold, familial mold. Other members of the family may also suffer due to genetic defect as said is uh, in the 19q, 13, 3, 13, 4 uh, chromosome due to mainly due to NLRP7 mutation and a rare, uh, a small amount due to KHDC3L. And recently there have been report of another gene mutation in NLRP5 and KD16 also. So they are finding some of the cases which may be due to mutation or other situation. Now, if you just to see the coronic villi, it has got the inner lining, the cytoplasm and outer layer of the syncytium. And from there, the complete mold or partial mold will be developing. They have got the intermediate trophoblast cells, uh, villus intermediate cells, as well as the implantation site uh, intermediate cell. The implantation intermediate uh, cytotrophoblast gave rise to the ESTT or placental cytotrophoblast tumor. Now, there is an intermediate type of uh, trophoblast which is at the chorion, which will go, uh, go on to develop the ETT. So, this is just uh, orientation of from which tissue the abnormal trophoblastic proliferation going on. Now, pathology, as said, uh, there is proliferation of both cyto and syncytial trophoblast in hydatriform mold, in invasive mold, chorea carcinoma, and continue, and these cells continue to produce high concentration of HCG. Other than in PSTT and ETT, HCG production in all other abnormal things are very high. Complete mold, generalized edema, which has been already shown, and this will be the microscopy. Almost every villi is having that hydrophobic change. And the partial mode, there is only mild and variable hydrophobic changes, and that will have a milder course, a very less chance of uh, development of GTN, and CC or chorea carcinoma is almost rare. This is the pathological finding. This is the hydrophobic villi. These are the normal villi, almost uh, every other villi area. Only few of them will show the adaptive change. Now, tip 2 staining was also shown. P57, it is uh, paternally imprinted, imprinted gene and will not be expressed. So if you strain the complete mold, it will be absent for P57 and in partial mold as well as in abortions, it will be positive. This was again shown. This complete mold is showing absence of the P57. In partial mold, it is positive. 
Now, invasive mold is, uh, is due to the penetration of the molar villi, most often from the complete endosperm mold into the myometrium or to the uterine vasculature. It will get into the vasculature also. Can metastasize also to the vagina and to the lungs. It is locally invasive and can penetrate the full thickness of the myometrium, leading to severe intraperitoneal hemorrhage. The lesion is characterized by microscopically the proplastic invasion of the myometrium with identifiable villous structure. Villous formation is there. The histological diagnosis is usually not possible because everything you will not get it only if you do a hysterectomy, you will see that. The Doppler study will show very highly vascular lesion there. So the histopathology will show the coronic villi, villi structure membrane, and it is getting into the muscle layer and even penetrate through the uterine wall. So this is the Doppler study, which will show very highly vascular area on the uterine wall, which is the inversely more present there, and very dangerous any time this uterus can rupture. Now, subthyroidal nodule can also be formed from choreocarcinoma as well as from invasive mold. And uh, this uh, case, you should not take a biopsy from this. Uh, she may be coming with the bleeding. You pack the vagina after putting in the catheter and give the chemotherapy after the scurry. It can perforate. The invasive mold can perforate like this, causing intraperitoneal. This is one of our cases. The patient was waiting for chemotherapy, but uh, she had gone for her sister's marriage and she came after three weeks. By that time, she was in shock. And we had to do a very, very difficult hysterectomy about 25 years back with, uh, I think, 10 bottles of blood, whole blood at that time. Now, choreic arsenoma will have sheets of cytotrophoblast and syncytial trophoblast without villus formation. Hemorrhagic and necrotic areas are seen. There is direct invasion to vessels, leading to distant metastasis. The choreic carcinoma is, though it is a carcinoma, it spread like a sarcoma through the bloodstream. So distant metastasis is possible in choreic carcinoma very quickly. 50 to 60 percent are following complete mold, rarely after PHM. Also, it is reported very rare. Can follow normal pregnancy, abortion, or ectopic. Vascular spread to the lungs and brain, liver, every area can be spread. And this is the characteristic hypochromatic very basically are nucleus of the choreic <clears throat> Both elements will be there. This is a necrotic and hemorrhagic area of the choreic arsenal where restriction has to be done due to the severe bleeding. Now, vascular PSTT is very rare, arising from implantation site, intermediate site of prophylax, less vascular invasion, necrosis and hemorrhage is rare, infiltrate into the layers of the myometrium, locally invasive, less vascular spread, confined to the uterus for a longer period. That is one uh, uh, feature which is uh, helpful to get a cure. Lymphoid inf involvement may be seen. Very low SCG or SCG may be absent. Uh, less sensitive to chemotherapy. If it is confined to the uterus, the structure will be very curative. So this is pathology. The cells, the intermediate prohibitive uh, cells are penetrating in between the layers of the myometria. It is uh, in between the layers of the, the myometria. These are the tumor cells. So it is very typical. So this was one of the case of one of my colleague has permission given to me. It was diagnosed. She has come with amenorrhea, irregular bleeding. Uh, pregnancy test was weakly positive. And uh, ultrasound also showed something. Curating showed PSTT. Very rare situation. And this is the growth. So hysterectomy in such cases will be curative when it is confined to the uterus. An epithelial trophoblastic tum uh, uh, tumor is rare and it is usually mistaken for choreic arsenoma. The growth is in the lower uterine segment or in the cervix. So it is usually mistaken for this thing. So this is the histopathology of ATT. Now, clinical presentation of the hydatidal mold is varying now. It is being diagnosed early because of the availability of the ultrasonography for evaluation of early pregnancy. In some part of our country, even in our state, people are coming even by eight weeks or seven weeks to know what the pregnancy is, is it going normally. At this time, the classical findings of a vesicular mold will be absent, and all the late presentations are very rare to see nowadays, even in our practice, when we started the center, the follow-up center uh, in 1990, we were having many of these cases coming with hyperemesis, aerotoxicosis, Early onset preeclampsia, presence of bilateral thicker lutein. These are all 
almost nil nowadays. It was almost, uh, uh, they are made to have a diagnosis probably, unfortunately, diagnosed a missed abortion, an embryonic pregnancy because they come at uh, seven, eight weeks and it will be a failing pregnancy like that, of course. The irregular vaginal bleeding following a period of amenorrhea with a uh, pregnancy test positivity is the usual way of presentation nowadays. Ultrasound will show a failing pregnancy with a blighted ovum or an embryonic pregnancy or missed abortion. That will be the diagnosis because it is impossible to have any early finding of molar change below nine weeks. Usually such failing pregnancies are treated by medical abortion. No tissue is available for HPE. Unfortunately, even early vacation will not prevent the uh, uh, development of GTN in such case. So unfortunately, some of these patients are going to come to us at a later stage because there is no follow-up or tissue diagnosis. So this is a classical presentation of molar pregnancy where the pregnancy is beyond 12, 14 weeks. And no doubt about these cases with the presence of bilateral thigal luteal cysts and the partial mold with the local or focal attitude change, presence of a fetus, which may be abnormal. And uh, that's the thing. This is the case what we usually see. They come at the early weeks of pregnancy, which is not having an embryonic cold, no yolk sac, something amorphous mass. And this particular case reported was, she was seen at the seventh week like this, but she came again at 10th week with bleeding. At that time, there is something suggestive of a molar problem. So, that is a problem now. At this stage, if you evacuate or uh, medical abortion is done, you don't make a diagnosis of molar pregnancy. And these cases, even to evacuate at this stage, may develop GTN at later stage. That is a problem nowadays. So to overcome that, you have to just remember that after time delivery, the SAG will be negative even after two weeks. If it is an abortion like the termination of pregnancy, it may take maximum four weeks. In vascular mode, it may take 12 to 14 weeks. If it is going up, it is GTD or uh, I mean GTN. So in every case of abortion evacuated, even if you are not in a position to do the histopathological study of the products, at least please do a urine pregnancy test after four weeks. The RCOG recommends after three weeks. I am telling after four weeks. There is no business for the SCG to be positive. It was a simple abortion. So if it is positive, then you have to have a proper follow-up of that case. So that is how you can solve such cases. We had one patient coming with the late stage after evacuation in the early first trimester, later on coming with regular bleeding. Then she was told that it is only natural to have some bleeding irregularly after abortion like that. And she came with the perforation of the uterus with the interperitoneal hemorrhage. So that tragedies can happen because of the availability of modern technology. My primary evacuation uh, management of adaptive home mold is uh, definitely by suction evacuation irrespective of the size of the uterus. Is the with the mold in situ in the elderly multiparous woman is an option, but it is more uh, morbid, morbid condition. The patient may be anemic, it is not fit for such a major surgery. It is better always by evacuation of the mold by suction. But in the early part of our uh, uh, Study, we have done hysterectomies in about 10, 15 cases. But whatever you do, whether it is hysterectomy or evacuation, all those patients will require regular follow-up. The investigation minimum required is a complete blood count, HCG before evacuation if possible, LFT, RFT, and thyroid function test, especially if the uterus has gone to beyond 16 weeks size, and, uh, and electrolytes also may be checked in such cases. Now, evacuation model, suction evacuation under anesthesia is the method of choice, as we said. Then ultrasound guidance is minimize the perforation, uh, chance of perforation as well as uh, make it complete for uh, uh, evacuation. NDT prophylaxis is recommended for negative patients. Cervical priming, though controversial, is safe. Of course, we have seen that very early pregnancy evacuation is difficult. It may not come out. Because the patient hasn't started bleeding. So you have made a missed abortion diagnosis like that and the cervical ripening with the cytotype or the PGE1 for about two hours, not induction of abortion, which is contraindication or not recommended. 
if you want to soften the cervix which is there otherwise you dilate under anesthesia make it complete because subsequent bleeding will not be due to the incomplete abortion that is the important thing if she comes again with the bleeding due to incomplete abortion you are not sure whether it is complete or not is the problem now oxytocin started in the beginning as per the recommendation of international society for study of prophylactic disease and by figo rcg says that only by the completion you start the oxytocin but we recommend if the uterus is 16 weeks and above always start the oxytocin because our primary concern is the hemorrhage and also chance of a perforation of the uterus and over the patient develops bleeding of course you have to start uh i don't know how these lines have come uh suction evacuation using a cannula which is 12 to 14 at the end of the procedure have a gentle curative so that you are the evacuation is complete if it is under guidance of the ultrasound it is better but availability has to be seen uh, it is the molds which is evacuated on the bottle a hysterectomy is possible with the mold in situ but the she will require require the follow up uh, we recommend always uh, usg after one week of the evacuation to make sure that the uterus is empty so that subsequent bleeding is not due to incomplete evacuation and if there is any retained products always uh, completed by a second curettage after one week otherwise there is no place for a repeat curettage after your uterus is empty by the first evacuation uh prophylactic chemotherapy again mentioned is controversial because you can always detect uh, by regular follow up and get a cure if it is dtn but in case where it's not possible to have a regular follow up you don't have that facility or the patient is not likely to come and she is having high risk low risk mold there is no place for dtn because it will i mean chemotherapy prophylactic because it will not have any effect in high risk cases only it will have some benefit in cases where it's not possible to have a reliable follow up you can uh, advise them uh, prophylactic chemotherapy in patients who are over 35 years size of the uterus more than 4 weeks for the gestational age pre evacuation hcg of more than 100000 international unit per liter bilateral big thick luteal cysts these are the risk factors for dtn to follow so these patients who are not likely to have a reliable follow up can be advised uh, chemotherapy prophylactic but by either methotrexate or uh, actinomycin d but it is also recommended that if you start then see that she goes in for complete remission so it is just not one injection probably you have to repeat the course to see that the stage is negative so that she will not come with a resistant disease later on. so it is better that you have the regular follow up and then only on indication you start the chemotherapy as per the or and other things so follow up after better to keep the patient overnight after evacuation SCG after 24 hours, which may be the basal value, USG after one week, if incomplete, uh, repeat curettage, SCG, clinical follow-up is necessary for all cases. Serum SCG every week till negative and plus two or three more estimations. It is okay that if it is not possible to have the weekly assay, but it's okay to have once in two weeks assay also, that is good enough which will not you will not miss the development of gtn in such cases because initially we were doing the radio immunosay we were not able to do every week we kept the thing and we started that doing after every two weeks and such case also we could pick up without uh, within 12 to 14 weeks of evacuation so we never missed any case so that's why i say that i think there is a recommendation by rcg also now that you can check it only once in two weeks also satisfactory but the scg has become negative within 8 weeks she requires only 6 months follow up from the date of evacuation a patient who has become negative by 8 weeks only total of 6 months follow up from the date of evacuation if she has taken more than 8 weeks to for the scg to become negative then 6 months from the date of that normalization of scg that is the protocol that we can not to have the patient for asking them not to become pregnant you have to come regularly you are having a risk of cancer of course that has to be told in a mild way 
and patient is uh, afraid of and she may not come at all. So give the shortest safe period is uh, like this, negative by eight weeks, another, uh, I mean, not another, from the date of vaccination, six months. If it is not taking more than eight weeks, then from the normalization for another six months. It's necessary only once in a month check is only sufficient. I mean, only required. A PHM can have shorter follow-up once it has become negative, only one more test after one month. If it is negative, she is out. Contraception can be given. Low dose oral pills can be given. A CG after 10 weeks of subsequent pregnancy if she had a chemotherapy during the previous molar pregnancy. So regular follow-up, this is uh, one of the photographs that we have taken about uh, 25 years back when we started the program, I think 1990. You can see all are young girls and that is where we were having and we are also having elderly. We had uh, more than 10% of the multiparas uh, having more than 35 years at that time. So we had a very high incidence of GT and uh, GT, I mean, with mode at that time. But nowadays it is settled to half of that. You can see this is one of our oldest patients and uh, uh, young girls along with her. So it was uh, the teenagers and the elderly. This is only the eldest patient, but we had many patients in the 40s. In 35 and 40s, grand multiparas were there. Now, uh, GTN diagnosis, we said, I think, Dr. Pevin, how much uh, I can, of course, this is uh, covered in the GTN diagnosis? Yes, sir. The next time, yes. Yeah, okay. I'll skip it. I'll skip this one. Familial. Familial is, uh, uh, this is another interesting uh, case study, which we can tell about the familial mold. Two sisters were referred to as follow-up after evacuation hydratic mode. The eldest sister had a 10 and successful pregnancies. Four were confirmed as a complete mode, including the last one in 2003. She developed GTN and was treated with methotrexate folic acid. The youngest sister had four early pregnancy loss of which two were confirmed as complete modes. The second and third sisters were all four girls having normal children, no history of consanguinity. So we started to study these cases because we thought that's a familial uh, recurrent mode. We have collected the blood samples of all the four girls, their husband, their parents, and also the tissues of the previous molds, uh, the paraffin fixed tissues, and everything was taken to UK and US for the extraction of the DNA and the genetic study. And we could see that the father and mother were heterogeneous for the mutation NLRP7 and the eldest uh, uh, sister and the youngest sister were homogeneous and that is why they were developing the recurrent molar function. The second and third sisters were having normal heterogeneity but uh, not homogeneous. So they were not manifesting. So in these girls, uh, the first and the last, the only hope is to have own, own donation IVF to have a child. Uh, there is a case of twin pregnancy with the mold. This was sent to us as a partial mold at uh, 15 weeks, but after seeing two, three scans by that time they have had, was showing that the placenta on one side and the molar tissue on the opposite side with the normal looking fetus. We have done the 3D ultrasound. You can see the placenta here, the molar tissue here, normal fetus like that. So we thought it had. So we have done a stereotyping by Amniosynthesis and found to be normal. We have warned them because of the bleeding can be happen at uh, any time and she may be having the risk of uh, operative delivery at any time without getting the baby also. They agreed for all those things. And this is the result. By 38 weeks, she had gone into spontaneous labor. You can see the molds are degenerated mold. She didn't develop uh, the preeclampsia. This is the normal placenta. The uh, lucky thing that after 26 weeks, the beta SCG was plotting or coming down. So that is why the, we were happy that the pregnancy may be continued to play. So this is a successful story that, that I think the study results and other things uh, of our series. And this is from where uh, we could start uh, the center. So it is a effort by everyone to have a coordinated work there should be a special day for the uh, GTD clinic. 
they should be all followed up they should be called if they are not coming and then according to the diagnostic criteria and for the as per the score only treat according to that thing whether single or multi agent thank you once again if at all any clarification required i may be happy to do that okay thank you we stop sharing please thank you very much sir thank you very much for your elaborate presentation now there is the question and answer sessions and if there is anybody they have any question please raise your hand and, and you can ask your questions with your own and otherwise you can share your questions in that chat box so our faculties can answer and probably we have our okay are you here okay she was with us yes it was a, um, all the lectures were fantastic it was really really wonderful and i'm fascinated by the familial mold that's so so interesting um i i i have a general question for the speakers all of you which is there is clearly and and you might have touched upon it but maybe if you could expand there's clearly a difference in the incidence of gestational trophoblastic disease, say in South Asia compared to North America. Uh, and I was wondering what you thought were the factors that caused this to be a very common disease in your part of the world and an extremely rare disease in our part of the world. What are your thoughts about that? Okay, can I? Can I? Yes, sir. So uh, thank you, ma'am, for that question. This was uh, bothering us for quite some time. Uh, the simple reason that I could find out from our series of at that time about uh, 10 years uh, series of 1,700 cases and the epidemiological factors, we had a considerable number of teenage pregnancies and also multi-parous women with the elderly patients. As we now understand, it is the abnormal ovum that results in vesicular mold. And abnormal ova are produced more in the esteems or reproductive life. To implicate the nutritional factors to any disease is very difficult to correlate. Even though so many things were pointed out that uh, uh, vitamin A deficiency, all those things were postulated very long back. But nobody has done a thorough study or is not possible also. Uh, like that uh, in Vietnam, when the, the something was going on, the spraying of the uh, agent orange as a VD side was related to the higher incidence. But whatever it is, difficulty is to get the accurate incidence by proper analysis, whether it is in pregnancy, whether it is in deliveries, uh, are you including everything? And also to get the data, especially in this part of the world, is not accurately recorded. The pregnancy events are not accurately uh, recorded. The abortions are not properly recorded. And nowadays, when the things are done possibly properly in Western part of the world or UK or US and European countries, as I said, in the West Eastern part also, I have seen the report recently from Japan as well as from other Southeast Asian country, the incidents that they reported recently are the same as it in UK or Europe. So I think uh, it is the difficulty in getting the data uh, which shows this difference. And also the other epidemiology factor, there is surely it is the reproductive age of the woman. Uh, we are having a, even today, because some of the religious uh, consideration and other things, there is more of teenage pregnancies. And also the limiting the family size and the age, uh, things are going on, but now it is uh, all getting under. So from about 25 years back, incidence was high in my university, but now it is settling down. And there's a definite change in the pattern of the incidence of teenage pregnancy as well as elderly women coming for uh, delivery. Naturally, as per our theory of the abnormal ovum coming, the extreme of reproductive age is the influence, major influence. We cannot say anything about our rice eating habits and other things, so that was postulated early, or uh, deficiency of beta-carotene, we don't know how to estimate the beta-carotene in everyone, 
So these are all difficult propositions and my uh, concern or confirmed conviction or my accepted theory that extremes of reproductive age is the most important reason for adults for more. That is my conclusion. <laughs> and I have proven it in my study also about analyzing uh, more than 67,000 deliveries and then number of vesicular mode. I have shown the trend in the age incidence in the teenagers as well as the elderly women and the incidence of uh, adults for more. So I have established that way. I didn't publish it, of course. I should. Rather. So that is hopefully my answers, ma'am. Okay, we, we have our Agway President Ahuja sir and Dr. S.K. Giri sir, your past president, sir. If you have your personal experience about you, you can recommend, sir. Please. I'd like to come on. Professional Dr. Giri is speaking. Sir. Dr. Ajay, speak up, please. Hearing, sir, Dr. Giri, Dr. Ahuja. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Dr. Ahuja, speak up, please. No, it's always a pleasure to hear Dr. Shetekran. Both the talks were wonderful. No, my, my issue is I'm basically a pure gynae oncologist. We never had to deal with vesicular both in the last 37 years of my practice. So I would not be able to comment much on uh, this, but only I have a question which normally most of our students also have because the criteria for diagnosis, because I, I don't know whether you'll be discussing GTN in subsequent talks, but uh, one issue is that uh, when we put the criteria for a diagnosis of GTN, uh, we have all those parameters of HCG monitoring and histological diagnosis of choriocarcinoma for which we do not need to wait for rising titers and all that. But uh, what happens in the case of uh, PSTT and epithelial uh, trophoblastic tumors, which are not associated with raised markers, is this always a retrospective diagnosis or you have a prospective way of approaching such patients? Uh, it's a very good question and problem question, actually. It is true that this... Uh two types of the tumors doesn't have a marker. They are having a marker which is not easily picked up. So it is basically probably a retrospective diagnosis. As I said, in one of the case, what we my colleague had was a irregular bleeding, some amenorrhea, positive pregnancy test, which was weak, and uh, DNC has picked up that uh, PSTT. But otherwise, sometimes for them, they present uh, abnormal bleeding only, AUB. They are present as AUB, and you will not suspect any DTM there. And uh, while doing the hysterectomy, you must see. So usually, these cases are confined to the uterus for a longer time than other things, because the spread is very slow. And you may be... Sound is so low. So that is... Can uh, I hear you, sir? Okay. So... All other cases, we are going for the SCG only. The GTT and ETT are different categories of the placenta trophoblastic tumors, and they are not uh, diagnosed on the uh, marker. So all other cases, we heavily depend upon the marker, SCG, and also the system should be picking up all forms of abnormal SCG. In malignancy, you have more of malignant, I mean, abnormal SCGs not the regular SCG. The system, assay system should pick up everything. And one system we are happy with is the emulate uh, the uh, system by, uh, uh, and that is the one which is going to pick up because the hyperglycosylated SCG, the SCG without the uh, C terminal, the free beta SCG, all those abnormal SCGs are more in malignancy unlike the normal pregnancy. So the, the uh, emulate system will pick up all these. So it is the way to get this uh, diagnosis done by SCG. So it's a wonderful marker, unlike any other. And we treat on the marker and not by histopathology. If you get the histopathology, well, confirmed, it is okay. But otherwise, we don't depend on the uh, histopathological diagnosis of these things. And uh, in our uh, side, I was... Uh, told by my colleagues in the oncology department, they are having less of burden because of our regular follow-up. They are not getting the very late cases. So we were happy that we could pick up the cases at the 
14 the week minimum maximum otherwise eight 10 weeks itself we will be knowing the degree of fall it falls by one log every week that is the degree of fall of scg is a very good marker we have seen it and it has to be properly studied so that is why you are correct that we don't depend upon the histopathology for chorea carcinoma even if you get a tissue that is of course confirmative otherwise it is on the marker hello yeah um, what is the uh, immunostaining you have shown a slide on immunostaining on partial molar pregnancy and uh, please, can you man, repeat this slide or explain the importance of it in clinical background? No, it is important to distinguish with the partial and complete mole because complete mole has a high, higher risk of developing uh, GTN compared to partial mole. But it's not that significant. It is, okay. uh, I will say, academic interest. I will say it is of academic interest of developing the science so it is immunohistochemistry we're demonstrating the maternal allele there or maternal genome there which is absent in complete mold which is present in partial mold which is present in abortion so when you are not having a it is not easy for the early abortion or early mold to have a histopathology also the histopathology and ultrasound correlation may be a maximum of 50 or 60 percent in a very early mold you, the ultrasound is, uh, they may make a uh, diagnosis of an embryonic pregnancy and you are happy to get a medical mm -hmm. abortion done on that patient. It could be a mold. That's why it is very okay. difficult, even histopathology also, there should be a very well-trained histopathology pathologist to say that it is complete mold or partial mold in the below 10 weeks or seven weeks abortion that you are making. So that's why they were having this uh, diagnosis made. It's not at all mandatory to have mm -hmm. something in our day-to-day -day practice in our country. It is not at all required. It's the development of a science, I'll put it that way. To have some knowledge of science is good, that's all. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, another question is that, um, like we, I, I managed a patient who had a history of previous mold. In subsequent pregnancies, uh, after the, at the time of delivery, I thought of sending the placenta for histopathology. It was a normal pregnancy after that mold, but uh, there is a written. It is written in the textbook that we should send the placenta for histopathology. Uh, um, is there any? Yes. A patient who had a complete remission without any need for chemotherapy. Now the present recommendation is not to do any such thing because it was seen that a patient who had for some persistent disease can have chorea carcinoma of the placenta or of the baby or head cell. And that's why the beta HCG has to be checked after six or 10 weeks okay. in all pregnancies, all subsequent pregnancy was the initial recommendation, but later on they changed on to only to those who had the chemotherapy previously need only this uh, check because there's a fear of some of the prohoplastic elements which is dormant. Mm. Sorry, you are muted. Yeah. Sir, sir have, have they, they will, that uh, dormant cells will be stimulated by the very high con concentration of uh, estrogen produced during a pregnancy. And they can develop even choreocarcinoma during that pregnancy. There has been report of the chorea carcinoma coexisting with the pregnancy. So that's a tragic situation. So these are some of the very rare situations where the dormant cells, which are stimulated by the very high concentration of estrogens, and they develop a chorea carcinoma while they are pregnant. Or after delivery, there can be evidence of chorea carcinoma by placental examination. In that case, you have to check the beta HCG of the baby also. It might have gone to the baby also. Well, that's why. But these are all very rare situations. In a patient who had a complete uh, remission without treatment, now we don't recommend all those uh, extra things. But it is better to have a patient who had a mole earlier, since mm -hmm. the recurrent mole is almost 10 times, how to have a proper USG evaluation in the first trimester. So that is having running the risk of molar, another molar problem. So that is the thing. So you are correct. It was there earlier, but nowadays it is also true that patient who had GTN, uh, uh, 
vascular mold earlier can have subsequent choroidal carcinoma during the next pregnancy itself mm. it's also there that's why the risk has to be in mind for those who are chemotherapy especially mm -hmm. sir uh, we got Any question? More question? I think there is something on the chat box. Yes, chat chat box. Yeah. Okay. Something it is all answered. Uh, Doctor Akuja, when are we going to meet? <laughs> yes. Giri sir, have you sir? Your comment, I please, mean, sir. I mean, our egoic phone meet my first time. Giri, sir. Okay. Uh, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the, uh, yes, uh, um, Dr. Sakharan's uh, deliberation was one of the best uh, in, the, uh, in the country regarding the TD. So uh, I don't have much to say, but regarding this uh, after a normal delivery, Uh, so placenta, as Dr. Sakharan told, is not to be sent, nor be tested to be done when the patient has not received uh, chemotherapy. The patient has received chemotherapy or the patient has become GTN and received chemotherapy. There is the need of sending the patient's placenta and uh, for uh, histopathology after deli normal delivery of even, and beta is to be sent after six to eight weeks of uh, the delivery. So beta is to be sent. Uh, regarding um, regarding uh, the risk of G GTN, regarding when to uh, when to declare the GTN, and uh, FICO 2018 has already omitted the six months of uh, high level of uh, beta CG. So only three criteria are there. One is plateau, other is uh, uh, increase in titer, and third the third one is uh, evidence of choriocarcinoma. This choriocarcinoma evidence is uh, very rarely we get. Perhaps. Uh, After doing uh, hysterectomy or so, so only the two criteria of either plateau and two and uh, high, uh, uh, rising titer of beta uh, CG will help us to diagnose whether this GTD has become GTN. And for one word of GTD, and GTN is a malignant GTD. GTD itself is a potential malignant disease, and out of which GTN is a malignant GTD, which requires mostly requires chemotherapy. Exiting this PSTT and ETT, which is diagnosed after hysterectomy, usually we cannot diagnose these two diseases uh, before uh, hysterectomy. But if there is a constant uh, bleeding, all these things, perhaps we have to go for hysterectomy. And there is, we can on, on histopathology we find out the intermediate cells in the tissue and diagnose yet either PSTT or ETT. So, uh, and Dr. Ahuja told that uh, and how to diagnose this thing it become difficult, really difficult. It is it is by method of exclusion only that uh, we don't get anything. Beta CG is very less, and the HPL, which is which is the diagnostic criteria, which is not available, and okay. only can uh, only it can be done by hist by, by ISC methods. HPL uh, can be done tissue, but before and SCG uh, HPL is most probably it's an expensive one. Dr. Sakran, what is your opinion? And, and uh, what exactly was the thing? I didn't get it, sir. Sorry. No, no. I didn't get it well. HPL, HPL, HPL. Uh, to... HPL, HPL is yeah. uh, histochemical. No, you, 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 are, uh, you are just unmuted. Unmute, just please. Dr. Sakran, please unmute. Dr. Sakran, please unmute. No, it is again histopathology. It's only it's not very large quantity that yeah. may be there compared to HCG. The HPL yeah. may be more, but it cannot be again detected by the immunase. It may be histochemical histochemistry will show the HPL there. So it is all not for a clinical way of diagnosis. It is all missed. The cases which may have a cure catch like uh, that, we may get it there if you are lucky. And otherwise, only on post hysterectomy. The cases of the uh, PSTT with uh, more than four years interval is uh, having a very poor prognosis, and they are not cured by surgery. Also, so they may have to have very multi-agent chemotherapy, though it is resistant to the normal thing. But that is the thing. So the suspicion is not there. 
usually it is not following vascular mold it can follow vascular mold also so that is another problem it is following a normal pregnancy either choriocarcinoma or pstt are missed uh, till late till they come with the secondaries so that is the problem so all these conditions other than uh, the invasive mold as well as choriocarcinoma can be diagnosed by the marker but other things are not possible sir yeah. that is the problem Sir, sir, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Sir, suppose a new case, there's no history of any GTN in the past pregnancy. First time she came in the OPD with the 14 week size uterus and 163,000 beta SCG. So, sir, for starting the chemotherapy, first we have to uh, do the uh, beta SCG two to three times. Is it increasing or plateau? Uh, for the diagnosis or the confirmation of our yeah. uh... no no Monica this is not that case this is that two three things are rice and other things are for the cases following acyclar I mean vascular mold immediately this patient had uh, no history of any evacuation done recently no sir might have no, had sir. delivery or a pregnancy earlier she had a pregnancy delivery earlier no sir one year back yeah. So one year back, uh, she has a history of normal delivery. Normal delivery. Okay, this can follow after that. So when you are having 1 lakh, 100,000 and more with a mass of 16 weeks, immediately go for the metastatic workup, chest X-ray, MRI brain, liver, everything, and then score the disease. Sir, it is normal. There's no metastasis. Pardon me? Sir, there's no metastasis. Sir, I did not be, uh, but to see the interval between the last pregnancy event, then the level of SCG, the size of the tumor, number of metastases, she will have, if it is correct, there will be positive X ray findings on X ray, and also brain may be showing some, liver may be. I agree. Yeah, so you have to do the proper metastatic workup, have the score, and this, this patient will require. Most probably multi agent chemotherapy because the score will be definitely high. Definitely high score. If it is more than six, definitely. Only thing is, I am afraid whether she is having the ultra high risk group or not. So you do the MRI, brain, liver, everything you have to check and okay, uh, sir. score the disease. And uh, very challenging. Sir, again, you are muted. Sir, unmute, okay, please. Sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I just want to one. Uh, uh, I think that Doctor uh, Devan wanted. It. I don't know how I understood was whether you take any time a single value of SCG in such a situation, which is above one lakh and only a uterine tumor following a, a normal pregnancy, uh, or you have to wait for a serial rise for two to three weeks. I think she wanted to convey that. So, okay. yes, in sir. this case, sir, uh -huh. in this case, sir, there is no question of serial rise. If there is secondaries and plus that high value, it is uh, to be taken. No, as no secondary, a solitary uterine mass. It is 16 with, uh, weeks again, within 16, 14 weeks size. Why the uterus is of that size? At it, least, even if it is low risk, start the chemotherapy for this patient with the mass. Yeah, that, that, that's the question, I think. So, what, yeah. what you, because your criteria are plateauing, rising, and all that. That is, so that is if you have a, this is a very solid tumor. This is a solid tumor with a more than 100,000 okay. unit, and you cannot go for a tissue biopsy because she may bleed severely. Yes. So, that is the other problem. So, with that result, you have to check uh, the metastasis. Has to be properly check MRI, CT, CT of the chest, MRI brain, uh, CT of the complete abdomen, and uh, of course, the Doppler study of the complete pelvis. All those things are to be done yes. to rule out the metastasis. There will be. Uh, uh, can okay. I speak something here? So, uh, the doctor, how does uh, the criteria was when you are following the GTN, GTD cases? When you are following a case of GTD, a molar pregnancy? And if there is rise, if there is a plateau, then you detect the GTN. But this is a case directly has come to come to you with a mass abdomen with a uh, beta CG of uh, more than one lakh. And uh, uh, perhaps yeah. uh, perhaps uh, here is the role CG now gone on GTD, GTN now. She requires some treatment for either chemotherapy or surgery or something. 
Yeah. So try chemotherapy, she may not respond. But you have to, since it is curable with chemotherapeutic agents, uh, you, probably this is a case which may require multi agent chemotherapy. A solid tumor of 14 weeks after one year of the last pregnancy, very high beta HCG, all those things you put. And also, chest, uh, you may have to do a chest CT. X ray may miss the metastatic mass. There will be metastasis. If it is, beta HCG is, no, I mean, correct value of more than 100,000. There should be a metastasis in the lungs. There may be metastasis in the brain uh, by this time, and it will be a, a metastatic disease. Uh, Monica, I am uh, eagerly yes, sir. waiting for the result. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I'll sir. be eagerly yes. waiting for the result of your case. Okay, sir. I will let you know, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Dr. Bhagolokhi Nayak is with us. Dr. Bhagolokhi. Thank you, Dr. Sharna. I think after all the stalwarts have already spoken so much, I think I have very less to add. Just a, a word about the prophylactic chemotherapy. Yes. Sir, yes. Um, uh, I think uh, though we all uh, think that there's no role of prophylactic chemotherapy, but I think in some situations, sir, because you have already highlighted very much there are, that there is a set of uh, tumors which would need chemotherapy, like more than one lakh, more than a uterus size, large, large chemotherapy. When we have such a patient and we are sure that that patient uh, is unreliable for follow-up or for beta SCG follow-up, sir, uh, could we recommend uh, her for chemotherapy? Uh, that is one of my questions. And number two is that I think there is a study by Borkovis et al. in which they have shown that a single course, because in methotrexate, we, as sir has recommended that it has to be a continuous courses of chemotherapy till it becomes negative. But uh, they have shown a study that a single course of actinomycin D, the risk of development of GTN has been very, very low. And in case they have developed GTN, and then again, a single dose of actinomycin has been, a uh, single course, course of actinomycin has been able to uh, completely cure them of the disease. Sir, yeah, your comments, sir. Right. 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 Professor Bhagilishmi, very nice. You know better than me, anyway. Uh, to answer the situation of prophylactic chemotherapy, I was uh, convinced that not required because we also thought that our patients are also poor. They are also not very well educated in one part of the, our state, the Malapuram district. We thought that probably at that time, it was a little bit on the backward area in education. It is, uh, I'm talking about, about 30 years back. Now they are all equal. At that time, I was also afraid, but they were all coming. My follow-up is better than the, US, I mean, the American people or UK people. I was having 98 regular follow-up percentage of 98% of them had, and I could pick up. So that is why I was convinced. But you can prevent the incidence of GTN by giving prophylactic chemotherapy in the high-risk cases, as you said, as I have highlighted on those patients, not in every patient. Dr. Berkowitz and uh, 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 his uh, colleague was uh, very much for uh, actinomycin D as single injection, but they also left it. Uh, that, uh, of course, uh, it will reduce uh, from, say, this high-risk molar cases will have a risk of up to 30 to 40 percent of GTN development. If you give, it can be reduced to 7 percent, which is a very big achievement, especially for those who are not able to come for a regular follow-up. They require that uh, prophylactic chemotherapy. I said that the, all the studies were single dose. I said because there is a resistance to that drug, or they will, those who develop GTN, even fight of the, it will not prevent the GTN. It will reduce only. That is my other argument. It will reduce considerably the incidence of GTN if you give prophylactic one dose. But if they develop uh, GTN after the one course of uh, G, uh, prophylactic thing, they will have a more resistant case. So if at all you are giving, not to stop with one injection, you may have to see that she go in for complete remission by negative. HCG uh, subsequently. That is my recommendation that way. But all the studies are with a single injection. And even if they develop, you have got another drug to give. You can give it that way also. So only thing is to make foolproof that you, none of your patient is going to suffer from choreocarcinoma and die. 
I said, why not regular follow-up and select the cases which is possible and to achieve a remission. Very early detection of GTN, not even having the very late case. We are having all cases diagnosed within 14 weeks, only three, four cases beyond 16 weeks. So they had been lost, that one or two patients who were lost to follow up, they came later on and at that time, it was almost, uh, again, it was low risk cases. So with the score of three or four percent score that we were able to pick up. So I am thoroughly convinced that if you educate them, if you tell them that it's a cancer which can be 100% cured, you can have further children, that is the thing. And also a little bit that it's a condition that may go in for a cancer, may go in. So with that, we'll tell them that they have to come. And at the, at the same time, be, uh, uh, be sure about what you are on. Be, be sure that you are going to look after them. So they were all convinced, all my 1,700 cases at that time, which I followed for 15 years, were all, I am happy that they have come subsequently conceived. Even after chemotherapy, some of them have lost the hair because we have given, I think, Marco in six cases. So we used to have the yearly union. The people will come, those who are on follow-up, those who are having alopecia, who are having children. So they were all convinced that we are looking after them and they were 100% uh, 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 obeying our uh, request and coming. So that is why I am very much convinced that it could be done. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. From the textbook, it is uh, my own experience for a long time. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Um, um, can, sir, can you just uh, tell me what is the dosing of actinomycin D? Does it need to be taken like uh, methotrexate? No, no, it is uh, 0.5 milligram daily is the dose for GTN. For five days is the GTN or you have got the pulse actinomycin D also. So methotrexate mm -hmm. is given as a single dose of 50 milligram or 25 milligram at that time for a prophylactic dose. But uh, we are convinced with the uh, methotrexate folinic acid regime or eight day regime, one milligram yeah. per kilogram body weight methotrexate, alternating with 0.1 milligram of folinic acid IM. That the course is eight days. And beginning of every course, we will have the LFT, RFT, and the CBC done. And uh, very mild uh, mycositis and other things were seen, but no severe reaction. We had a problem with actomycin D because it has to be very carefully given intravenously. One, oh. we had a starvation of the drug and sloughing of that area. Oh. And that is the danger. So you have to be extremely careful. Better start a drip. Then once it is about 10, 15 ml or 100 ml, you add on to 100 ml saline and then give it as a infusion rather than pushing and making it a starvation. It's extremely dangerous. It will cause uh, sloughing of that area and it's not... Uh, 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 spill the drug onto a rice, you may lose your cornea. The potent the toxic drugs. So be careful on the administration part also. Even both methotoxate also handle properly. So I told my STEM browser, STEM browser told the lecturer, lecturer told the uh, PG, PG told the Indian, Indian told the nurse, and nurse gave the injection and it got uh, extravasated. So that is why afterwards I used to stand or I used to give myself. You had to treat with actomycin D also, some of the cases. Yes, sir. And one more little query I had. Like, sir, when we are scoring the patients, uh, I think uh, initially we had a low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. So now it has become low risk and high risk. So do you have any uh, doubts about the scores of five to six? And that uh, whether we should be more careful about these patients that whenever they show a little lag in fall, should we immediately change the chemotherapy or waste those golden uh, um, time, like uh, not okay. changing over, waiting if, if the fall is slow. Sir, your comment on that, sir. For all, your, all of your information, Dr. Bhagalashmi has edited a book on GTD. And uh, I am just to say something, that's why. Anyway, I'll answer that. See, initially, the scoring was by Baxter, with scoring which was taken up by WHO and later on by FIGO. And uh, 
pigo has put it as uh, low risk and high risk now for the last 4 uh, 5 years we are feeling this that risk score of 5 and 6 may not respond well to single agent therapy but some of them will res- respond so some of them will respond mean they are not exposed to the risk of multi agent chemotherapy so in the present uh, guideline for pigo which we have just sent also we have in recommended the intermediate score but we have put it that if you should be having a low threshold of starting multi agent chemotherapy for the risk group 5 and 6 still you can start single agent either methotrexate or uh, i mean acromycin d in this group of patients some of them will respond some of them will show when there is a level of scg which is little bit plateauing at the around 100 and above then from methotrexate you can switch out to acromycin if it is around 300 and above that the plateauing start is not coming down further that patient has to be on multi agent chemotherapy so that she will not resist and develop and all of them can get a cure so to rest of that 50% who may not respond and 50% who will respond to single agent why do you risk them for the multi agent chemotherapy the toxicity of it and if they show the resistance you can always switch over to other single agent or other multi agent chemotherapy and they will get 100% cure so that is the principle we are still not separating that intermediate group uh, in the latest uh, recommend, figure recommendation we are we concluded which was sent last week only that uh, we will continue to use uh, single agent either of it and low threshold for multi agent therapy that is the conclusion we will switch out to multi agent if at all there is any yes sir the only thing is that we have to be a bit careful when treating this patient that's yeah. the only thing yeah, yeah, sometimes sure. Uh, sure sure you have to be thank you sir uh, there was a question whether you can alternate uh, single agent multi uh, i mean methotrexate and acromycin yes you can do as another way of looking at it but better that if you see that plateauing around uh, above 300 better to go in for multi agent if it is around 100 you can switch out to the other one and you may get again some of the cure some of them will get a cure on complete remission with that single agent alone so why to risk them with the toxicity of multi agent that is the principle so you can go for multi agent low threshold for multi agent such group because they may not respond well still 30 to 50% may respond to single agent alone so why not to make use of it is the yeah yes and seen there any question if there is no question then is there any question tawhida was trying to say something yes tawhida tawhida we will continue with the next this thing no madam okay dr bagilashmi one is your book being published is it ready yes sir yes sir sir i'll send you the link for the ebook so it's okay. available on amazon i heard but i okay. have not yet seen the hard copy of the book only they okay. have sent us a link and uh, i have heard that it's available on amazon okay good thank you sir sir i'll send you the link of the book they have just sent it a few days back it's okay okay no it's okay just want to see the results okay yes, good yes. if do you, there is no question then we are at the end of the sessions we put that i am we are very much happy that we have too many faculties today we have yes can i have a can i have a question yes yes please uh just a query uh when we diagnose uh, post molar gtn in some institute we find that uh, after they diagnose and they want to start chemotherapy they start with single agent chemotherapy then uh, in some institute they just give single dose of methotrexate and wait it Will beta CG falls or not? But in some institute, once they start uh, methotrexate and folinic acid, they continue weekly till it comes negative. So, uh, what is actual recommendation? It is be- is it better to give single dose and wait for response, or it's when you start you go continuously weekly till it comes negative? But sir, uh, the basic situation is when you make a diagnosis of GTN, you have to do the 
metastatic workup. You cannot just put it as a uh, single agent or multi agent there. Whenever you make a diagnosis of GTN by this follow up, first thing you have to do a chest x ray. If the chest x ray is negative and there is no doubt, then probably you may not do any more uh, investigation for metastasis study. You can take it as that score. Then score the disease. Maybe the uh, distance from the antecedent pregnancy or molar pregnancy, the number of metastases if present, all those things you have to score and then only select the single agents. Not that GTN is always single agent, no. That is where we are going to have the failure of treatment. Always make the score after metastatic workup. So in following IDA, if you make a diagnosis of GTN, you can have only chest X-ray. If it is negative, you can stop it there. If the chest X-ray is positive, you have to go in for may, brain MRI, liver, everything has to be studied and score it and select that treatment. Then you have to, once you start the single agent chemotherapy, it is not one. There are different uh, regimes for the single agent. There can be weekly methotrexate of 50 milligram, can be alternate day methotrexate with folic acid. There can be infusion methotrexate also. So there are so many go according, not one, one dose. You have to have complete remission. And once a complete remission has occurred, then further two or three more courses are to be given. Because even when the HCG is negative, to produce one unit of HCG, there should be 10,000 number of cells. So once it is negative means it's not that the cells are negative in the body. So you have to further give, even if it has become negative, give three more courses, at least two more courses in a low risk GTN. So that is a recommendation. It's not that one course is given, wait for regression, and other things are not the way. It has to be negative and then two more courses minimum, if not three more courses in a low risk case. I hope sir? I yes. Sir, just last uh, thank comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, yeah. can I just um Shana, madam? Yes, yes. Madam, uh, I have no noticed that in our country. There is a change in like practice, like instead of giving folinic acid injection, they are adding tablet uh, folinic acid, oh. which is available as Folita M. Or yes, 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 they are giving 15 milligram yeah. folinic so acid. Is it, is it sufficient no. oral dose? No. no, that is recommended by the, the UK group yes. who are treating the maximum number of cases. We can't say not sufficient, but I will give only injection folinic acid. Oh. Another thing the is, drug um, has to be, if toxicity develops, that, that uh, normal cells have to be protected. That is the principle. At the same time, there will be a turf level, what is known as a turf level, a minimum level of methotoxate will be there in the body to be yeah. acting on the malignant cells. When yeah. to malignant cells, there are rapidly multiplying cells in the body, like the bone marrow, cells of the bone marrow, yeah, the lining true. epithelium and uh, mucosa, and the hair follicle and other things. So these are to be protected by giving folinic mm. acid injection is my thing. And even if the toxicity develops, until unless you give it, the toxicity will be severe. And mm. you have a higher dose for the methotoxide folinic acid regime. It is, mm. I think it is one milligram. Usually, one so the IM methotoxate is 0.4 milligram per kilogram body weight. Here is one milligram. So it is almost yeah. more than double, two and a half times. So that's why you have to give injection folic acid, but per orally, they are recommending 15 milligram folic acid. Yeah, that is their regime, which I am I'm going to take. Yeah. Yeah. I want to replace 50 milligram oral folinic acid. Yeah. Just for you. Um, sir, there, there is also another practice like just giving 50 milligram, one vial contains one um, vial contains 15 milligram folic methotrexate. So instead of uh, multiplying with the uh, uh, weight of the patient, one milligram per kg body weight, there is a tendency just for giving one um, money with one milligram, one ampoule of um, so you will be blocking the methotrexate. You will be blocking the methotrexate from its action on the malignant cells. 
Yeah. So, folic acid will block the action of methotrexate on the cell. You want to have the effective chemotherapeutic effect of the drug. If you get more, I know that it is 15 milligram. We used to get 5 milligram also. That is also a waste, I know, because uh, you can, it is only 0.1 milligram. So it may be 5 milligram maximum. So oh. it is all waste. 15 milligram oil is available. Ambul is available. I know that. But uh, you cannot give the whole the drug uh, because it will block the effect of methotrexate. And they are recommending acnomycin D, not methotrexate. But I am very much convinced about the methotrexate safety as well as effectiveness. Okay, Dr. Asma, please. Any other have any questions? If there is no other questions, then I request our scientific secretary to comment on this presentation of this today's the library session. Shana, I like yeah, to Rukia add something. To comment. Dr. Professor Rukia. Okay, please. Thank you very much for giving me time. It's very excellent discussion from our faculty, uh, from our native country plus abroad. Uh, thank you, Bhagavalokhi, to join with us. Um, I like to add something just for our students. Here is now 102 participants. So we are working at NICRH and there are many patients to refer to us. I, it is my um, comment to you that, and my advice to all juniors that if you don't think that you are not competent to complete evacuation in a single setting, don't do it. Please don't uh, give the patient uh, for a chance of repeat DNC. It is dangerous. Too many times patient come to us with repeated sonogram and repeated DNC. It is harmful for the patient, not only for the patient for her, but that cause disappointment of the patient. On the other hand, there are some patients they come to us in judicious use of methotrexate, sometimes by our gynecologist, sometimes by medical oncologist. So without evaluation of prognostic scoring and metastatic scoring and staging, one should not go that kind of practice. It is my comment. And another one is, if you anyone see any um, metastatic deposit at vaginal orifice or at the cervix or furnaces, please don't go for biopsy. Sometimes it causes torrential hemorrhage and patient come to us with shock. So this is my comment for our juniors. Please, please evaluate the patient and don't put the patient in risk. So, and please save the patient and their life because the, this malignancy is 100% curable, nearly 100% curable. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Your comment on DNC for molar cases. Sir, your comment. Shekran, sir. On? DNC, your comment on repeat DNC or anything in case of molar pregnancy or invasive bowel and residual disease in case. Uh, there there, are, there were some studies earlier on. Yes. They have shown that if you do uh, in a GTN uh, early diagnosis by HCG, and they have shown that uh, curatage has reduced the need for chemotherapy altogether or reduced the need of uh, number of chemotherapy. That is their study, but we don't do or they don't do nowadays. No, sir. Uh, it was the earlier study. It was the earlier yes. study. My, my question is not that. If your patients come to with a DNC with a retained product, in that cases, we must have to do the curate the patients and the evacuate the uterus. With that evacuation, we cannot go for the treatment because it's a single cell. If that is your comment is that single, if it is a single, the molar tissue or single cell, then it's a thousand that the disease. So, we must evacuate and we must yeah, evacuate the uterus. It may yeah. be either two times or it may be either three times. We must have to evacuate and complete the evacuation. Am yeah. I correct, sir? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. At the first sitting, that is the uh, when you are have. That's why even all of us are not having the facilities of under the guidance or ultrasound to do the evacuation. Yes. So it's better that you do a scan after one week. That is my recommended. We were using it that way. So that any retained product can be at least removed then. Because if it, the uterus was very big, it is not possible to empty the uterus completely at the first sitting itself. Also, yes, in the early pregnancy also, it is seen that the evacuation is incomplete. So many cases are coming 
back from evacuation from uh, periphery with incomplete evacuation resulting in bleeding and the scg going up and they are sending for gt and uh, treatment but once you see that product it is immediately we can see it is incomplete evacuation once you empty the uterus the scg will go down and patient will not require GT, uh, chemotherapy at all to so make sure the empty uh, removal is complete that is one of the primary treatment they used to empty the uterus completely do a curettage <clears throat> general curettage is not contraindicated yes sir not have a sir, so is, your message is after first evacuation in a molar pregnancy the one week after that we must go for the transvaginal ultrasonography or transvaginal yeah. scope is available yeah yeah, yeah. 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 make sure it is complete yes whether it is complete or not okay yeah and also the pregnancy test in every abortion what you thought as abortion after yes, sir. Week, because we are not able to do the hpr in all case of abortions yes, or products yes, of sir. are not available please let them have a urine pregnancy test four weeks after a uh, termination of early pregnancy that is not very costly not uh, uh, time consuming that can come with a check so the checkup after one month is with a urine pregnancy test so that this problem of missing a diagnosis and later on developing gtn is uh, prevented so that may be the thing we had one case like that. so what is the important message from shekran sir today is one is that in every case of molar pregnancy evacuation we must have to go for the ultrasound after at least one week to see this, to see whether the evacuation is complete or not before that we must not go for the third treatment and another message is from sir is that in every case of the uh, pregnancy either abortion missed abortion incomplete abortion everything and after curet after four weeks of that we must go for the at least a urine for pregnancy test yeah yes thank you thank you, sir. Thank you very much thank you now i request our scientific secretary to comment to this session with a lively session we are very much happy that we have too many the participants from dr and from the our the foreign participants everybody were lively discussed with this and there was in this session now our comment from our scientific secretary dr fm kamal thanks shahana uh, it was really not only lively it was quite educational yes. and i really learned many thing every time i listen i learn then i forget and i can i listen to it professor shekran and i learn because i think that is the process we cannot learn in one session because he is a living diksha encyclopedia on gtn so he says so easily but when i listen it seems very easy but then i forget then i again listen to him so it is really enjoyable to listen to him and thanks to dr ahuja dr giri and bhagya and also ak for joining us and um, as a oncologist what i found the one of the big challenge is that the what professor rokia was telling indiscriminate use of methotrexate when there is a suspicion start weekly methotrexate that is one culture that happens and also i realize some of our colleagues in periphery they are scared of doing the total evacuation so doing a partial evacuation they start giving the inter im methotrexate because giving im methotrexate is very simple and easy so what professor shekran was dr shekran was telling by doing this indiscriminate use what we are doing we are creating some resistant clone so end of the day which was possible to treat maybe a proper dosing of methotrexate end up in a case of multi agent chemotherapy even not a good responder so this is one very important thing like he told like the indiscriminate use of antibiotics as i am methotrexate is very easy we just not start give going for it this is number one number two another point he said that to give two cycle in low risk and three cycle at the end of the treatment that is a big challenge dr shekran because by that time patient become educated that beta hcg is the parameter so even you don't ask they do by their own and once they wait for the day when it comes to normal and from that day they started bargaining why should i do it and some of the patient even they don't listen to our suggestion because you know it seems that at the end of the marathon the runner become exhausted so after four five six cycle it is very difficult to convince them even it is normal you need to take three more cycles so that is another big challenge as oncologist i realize that when we are treating with multi agent especially multi agent 
And another is, as I told, that proper scoring is not always done. And slight rise, uh, fall of beta HCG keep tempting people of continuing the method exit and not understanding that it is not really a good response. Rather, you said that the resistance clone is there. And I think the last point I want to mention about the metastatic workup. You said about X-ray chest. I will say that we should not take a risk with the X-ray chest, even because in our country nowadays, CT scan is available in most of the remote area. And CT chest is a wonderful tool because in X-ray chest, 50% of the metastatic lesion we may sometimes miss. Similarly, when we are looking at the brain, we should do MRI, not the CT scan. Because in CT scan brain, hardly we will find the metastasis. And this type of metastasis is not a big metastasis. Sometimes it's a small metastasis. But that small metastasis change the score and change the approach. But if we know there's a metastasis, we can really treat properly and cure her. So I think we should be very aggressive whenever there is a high beta HCG or a big mass. Don't look at the money. Ask for a CT scan. Ask for MRI brain. I think that will save her life rather than spending a few thousand of rupees. So these are the few things. And finally, I will say, Shahana, this is an issue that we face every day. This is an issue we don't practice every day. So we forget. And I will request after a few months, you again invite Dr. Shekron to tell the same thing, to repeat, so that we recapitulate. And we, do, we don't allow us to make any same mistake. Because unfortunately, we are repeating the same mistakes, even we are listening. So we need to listen many, many times, and then we can improve ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramon for your <laughs> nice recommendation. You Thank, you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Now I request our, they, we, we are sorry that we cannot show the poll questions again because there is a multiple logging. So we are sorry. But even after that, there are three winners who participated the first time in the poll voting. And uh, Tania, you please show the poll winners. And before that, I request our uh, president, the chairpersons of this uh, today's sessions, to say some things and conclude the session. Sir, please. Thank you, Shana. Sir, before what? that, I, I, I have said, and for the, all the participants, we want, want to make the another session like the GTD session. And we want to include the, all the medical colleges. And here are the, all the medical colleges who are participated today. You please yeah, uh, ready your, the patients who are the complicated patients, everything. And who are, and who are the patients, they will be presented the different type of cases, what we face. You please the ready them and we'll discuss in, in the, our the workshop and we'll make another workshop on GTD like our cancer service workshop and endometrial cancer workshop. You please prepare your patients. The, all the medical colleges participants are requested. Ahana, uh, I must our president, Professor Haisar, to congratulate Bhagya for this yes. book. You can see in the screen. Yes, yes. Book, yes. Book. Yes. Congratulations to Dr. Michael Lakinak. Good job you have done. Yes, yes, the available in Amazon. Yeah. Thanks to Dr. Sekar and also the authority in this subject, I can say. They also has taken part in this. Thanks to all the participants who have taken part in this discussion. So encouraging us and organizing seminars. Kamala said that we can engage this. After some time, not recent. They have done maybe two, three months, one month, two months after this. I don't know what they will discuss. It might be it's a high time or probably it's 10, 30, two hours past. Thank you all very much once again. See, see you again next Tuesday. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Tanya, who are the poll winners? Winners, Dr. Afroj, Dr. Fatima Masraf, Dr. Jackie Nahid. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Shahana, we end the program. Yes. yes. Before that, the winners, are, please show your food. Phone number in the chat box just for one minute. You please write your phone number in the chat box so we can send you the gift. 
Thank you so much. Can I have a boy? Amazon 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 Doctor Medical, I think.